Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll listen again to Mary's song, the Magnificat, uh, from the Gospel, beginning with verse 46. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from the thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. This is the gospel of our Lord. Dear brothers and sisters, that, that famous first line of Luke chapter 2 takes us to the Oval Office of Caesar Augustus. He, he issues a decree, and with the stroke of a pen, he compels the entire Roman world to get up and go to their ancestral hometown to register. That's pretty impressive. Uh, a whole empire's worth of power concentrated into one individual. But Luke he doesn't tell us about Caesar Augustus' decree so that we all hail Caesar. He says he's just setting the stage for the main event. The main event that happened. 1,500 miles away from Rome, that chaotic childbirth that Caesar Augustus was never briefed about. The, the, the main event was the newborn baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a feeding trough. To the uninformed, it seems so upside down. But isn't that upside downness isn't that pretty much the theme of the entire bible there are plenty of world class power players that enter the stage from genesis to revelation egypt the great empires of assyria and babylon and persia and and rome but none of those are the heroes of the story they're they're more like the the extras the background characters that God uses to highlight his theme, that he scatters the proud and that he lifts up the lowly. Caesar Augustus, he gets one line, then he disappears from the pages of Scripture. God has Luke use his ink instead to let us in on a conversation between two women that nobody else was paying attention to, to an old lady and a young maiden that God was going to use to forever change the world. Ask everyone alive today what they know about Caesar Augustus, and some of them will be able to tell you something. But ask those very same people what they know about the Virgin Mary. And that's going to make Caesar Augustus look like a footnote in comparison. God lifts up the lowly. And Mary got that. She knew that, that God didn't lift her up because she was so great. She was lifted up simply because God chose her. She, she gets it. There's nothing big about her head. After the angel Gabriel tells her that she will conceive and that her son will also be the son of God, she doesn't hike over to Elizabeth's house to exchange high fives and talk about, aren't we awesome? Her, her song is just one long, extended wow that 
someone the likes of God would notice and honor someone the likes of me. It's not so much wow as in surprise that, that God had departed so far from his normal way of doing things. This was more wow as in enduring amazement that this had always been the way that God works. But, but still, the, the wow, the wow never wears off. An example, Mary's, Mary's ancestors, when they're being treated like animals by the great pharaoh of Egypt, making his bricks, building his cities, ordered to throw their babies into the river, God performed mighty deeds with his arm. He scattered those who were proud in their inmost thoughts. For example, the Israelites, they didn't break their own chains. They were never the heroes of their own story. God was always the hero. He, he looked down on their enemies, looked down on their enemies who were puffed up with pride and who thought they were something and who were trampling all over those they deemed to be nothing. And God, he just flicks them away whenever he pleases. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, just flicks them away. And then he reaches down and he lifts up his oppressed people who were so helpless they could do nothing about it except cry out to God for mercy. As Mary sings her song, it's like her mind scans over the entire history of her people. And she's, she's known it for longer than she can remember, but it never ceases to amaze. Like 2,000 years earlier, that God promised Abraham that all nations would be blessed through his offspring. And then 1,000 years after that, how God promised David that his offspring would be a king who would sit on an eternal throne. And, and after God made those promises in the intervening years, during the time of waiting, the so-called smart money would have bet against all of God's promises. Especially when, when Abraham's offspring were enslaved and Egypt was trying to exterminate them all and when David's, the Babylonians were, were tearing down David's palace and hauling his offspring off into captivity. Who would expect that someone so low, that people so low could ever go so high but like Mary said, when God makes a promise, he never forgets. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. And now, and now add to that, wow, even more wow, that God would keep his promise through someone like Mary. Abraham and King David's offspring in her tummy, the Son of God in the womb of little humble Mary. You know, she doesn't call herself um, humble in order to, to brag about her modesty. When she calls herself humble, She's simply saying, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this. But God, true to his form, has made a nobody like me into a somebody. From now on, all generations will call me worthy. Except that's not what she says, is it? Not worthy. Blessed. The recipient of something undeserved. 
because I, because the mighty one has done great things for me. It's like she's saying, for me, I just can't get over it. For me, that someone like God would do something like this for someone like me. Mary's song reminds me of election nights. When, when enough states have been called and the major news organizations are, are confident enough to project who's going to be president of the United States for the next four years, then the victor gives a speech. Call me cynical, but I'm always skeptical about a line that's sure to come up in every one of those speeches, something to the effect of, I am so humbled that, that, that our, our great nation would, would have this kind of confidence in me. Maybe I'm cynical, but it gets me thinking that, that for the past year or more, this person has been flooding the airwaves and bogging down the internet with the message of how awesome they are and maybe how sinister their opponent is. And then after that, after that year of, of self-promotion, I don't know, <laughs> and then to hear them say, I'm so humbled. And part of me is maybe the tiniest bit suspicious that, that maybe that's false humility. Like maybe a, a, a charade to make themselves look, look even better. Like, not only am I awesome, I'm humble. There's two words in Mary's song that eliminate any whiff of false humility. They're in verse 47. My Savior... My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Her choice of possessive adjectives just speaks volumes. She doesn't say, God, the Savior of Israel, or God, the Savior of the world. This is intensely personal for her. She is the mother of the Lord. She's the mother of her God. But she's more than, she doesn't just see herself as a vehicle to deliver the Savior to the world. My Savior. She needs him just as desperately as everyone else. He's God, my Savior. I wonder if, if Mary were to come back from the dead today and maybe um, sit in the back row of church and, uh, and, and listen to us, listening to her words that, that she spoke in this, in this little house of her cousin on the Judean countryside 2,000 years ago. Uh, if, she, if Mary would, would, would just listen to us, listening to her, uh, she, she, must, she, 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 she must think, Wow! Like, I, I guess that wasn't an overstatement when I said all generations, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. But then, but then if the pastor were to go on to preach a sermon that extolled the virtues of the mother of God and put her on a pedestal and was saying, marry this and marry that, and as if she's the hero of the story, Mary... She'd be like, no, no, no. Weren't you listening? Didn't you notice in, in what I said? Didn't you notice all those lines that begin with he, he, as in God, that, that I was singing and rejoicing about what God would do for me? When a, when a king shows kindness to a, to a beggar, she might say, you don't, you don't commend the beggar's poverty. You praise the king's kindness. And if all that happened, uh, we'd probably be like, oh, yeah. Yeah, you're right, Mary. Thanks for, 
Thanks for sharing that with us. And I think it would forever refine our understanding of why her soul glorified the Lord that day at her cousin's house. My Savior. Could you say that together with Mary? My Savior. It's a confession, you know. Because if you need a Savior, that means that you're in a hole that you can't climb out of. In this case, you're in a grave and you dug yourself into it. It's, it's your sin. And you can't climb out of it by pointing your fingers at others or by, or by imagining that, that your plight isn't as pitiful as somebody else's. You can't, you can't say, my Savior, at the same time that you're offering excuses or puffed up with pride. You can't. My Savior, you can neither understand nor confess that unless you've been knocked off of the pedestal of your own making and have had your eyes opened up to the plight of your sin that leaves you with nothing to do or to say except to cry out to God for mercy. Listen to Mary's song. Look at who it is that God lifts up. He raises his arm that same arm with which he scatters the proud in their inmost thoughts. He raises his arm and he identifies the humble in their mess and he lifts them up. He raises his arm and it seems so upside down. Remember, this, this is the main event. Caesar, Augustus, and even the exodus from Egypt, they, they pale in comparison. Mary, she sings about the mighty deeds of God, and at that moment, God is round about the size of a gummy bear in her tummy. Who's the lowly one here? And he's not, that's not the bottom. There's the chaotic childbirth and the feeding trough, and that's not the bottom either. He descends further and further and further down, all the way to a cross, the, a whole world's worth of sin concentrated on one individual Do you know why he's down there? To get you. To lift you up. It seems so backwards, upside down to the uninformed and the unbelieving that God, he doesn't seek us in the heights where we're full of success and wonderful behavior and puffed up with ourselves and the heroes of our own story. God seeks us in the depths, in our emptiness and our weakness and in our guilt with our sins laid bare to God Nothing that we can do or to say, but to cry out to God for mercy. That's where God looks for us. That's where he finds us. And he doesn't leave us there. He finds us there 
to lift us up. He always remembers his mercy, no matter how far you've sunk. He always remembers his promise to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants. That's you forever. Maybe you've, you've known God's upside down ways for longer than you can remember. But still, when you're in the depths, when you're down there deep with nothing to hold on to except Jesus, it's, it's like the wow never wears away that the mighty one has done great things for me, not just for everyone, for me. I can't get over it for someone like me. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Amen.